done apologizing for putting up the best list late. You know the drill. Anyway, 2023, remember that? So I think 2023 is gonna go down as one of the worst and weakest years ever for the pop charts. I mean, a year where two of the big stories are the rise of right-wing country songs and the collapse of hip-hop, historians are not gonna look kindly on it. That's what I think other people will think, but I don't necessarily agree. For example, I think 1976 is a good year for music, but most pop nerds do not. Mostly because the number one hits were pretty bad. The number one hits in 2023 were even worse, by a lot. But if you look a little lower on the list, I actually thought this year was pretty good. I'm as surprised as you are, but I had a lot more candidates for stuff that should be on this list as opposed to the worst list where I realized right while I was filming that I didn't have a number four. I think I just ad-libbed something about, uh, I think it was David Guetta. I mean, that's really all he deserved. This list, I've put a little more feeling into, and I feel good about it. I think we're starting off 2024 on a good note. So let's get to the list. We're counting down. The top 10 best hit songs of 2023. Number 10. Every best list I've ever done is basically a continuation of the last. Remind me, how did I end last year's best list? I'm totally going to the Eras tour, by the way. I haven't bought my tickets yet, but I will find a way. Yeah, I did. Oh, hi! Oh, man. Great show. She played all the hits. London Boy, 10-minute version. Christmas Tree Farm with more Lana Del Rey. Amazing time. Fever dream high in the quiet of the dying. You were hoping that this list would be the one place where you could avoid hearing about Taylor Swift. Uh, yeah, why would I be stronger than any other place on earth? Taylor Swift reached a level of celebrity hugeness this year that we haven't seen in decades, becoming the biggest person in music, in film, in sports somehow. There are only a couple worlds left to move on to next, so get ready for that. You just made me feel so, so powerful. Like the rest of you, I also found it kind of tedious by year's end. I kind of feel bad that I, the world's most reluctant Swifty, got that concert ticket. My seat probably should have gone to someone more appreciative who would have put one of her most beloved songs higher than number 10. Bleach, be the last to know. Oh, it's Funny thing, I didn't get this song at all. Cruel Summer was released four years ago and quickly became the fandom's most beloved deep cut, and I just did not see the big deal. Maybe because I only heard it on the album, which felt like eating a bowl of stale marshmallows. I told everyone I knew that I thought it was mid, and that rhyming summer with ooh, oh, uh is not a good rhyme. I kept saying it over and over, but Taylor has spent the last two years celebrating her back catalog, so this song got resurrected as a radio single, and by the end of this year, I got it completely, and it pisses me off so much. You have no idea how angry that makes me. Or maybe I still don't get this song, honestly. I think I missed the boat. I think I'm listening to it entirely wrong, because I don't feel heartbreak when I listen to it, which is what I think the song is about. But I honestly don't care what it's about. In 2019, Cruel Summer was a breakup song. In 2023, it was a victory parade. Does anyone here know the lyrics to this bridge? Prove it! It was a power ballad anthem meant to be screamed at the top of your lungs with a stadium full of people, or at least shown on a big screen being performed in a stadium full of people. All its emotional hugeness turned into a celebration of the most popular person on the planet. Like, God knows she does not need more praise from me or from anyone, but I got caught up in it too. In the year where Taylor Swift was unavoidable, I could not get this song out of my head, and I couldn't stop myself from singing along. And hearing an arena full of people singing along just reinforced it for me. I mean, I saw the biggest pop star alive at the peak of her career. That's something I can tell my kids about, and hopefully it'll explain to them why they can't go to college. Those tickets were not cheap. Number nine. <laughs> How did we let this man disappear from the pop charts? Just absolutely disgraceful. We should all be ashamed. Anyway, as I write this, more than a decade since Usher had a top 10 hit, he is fucking killing it. 
his Vegas residency has been cleaning up. He's going to play the Super Bowl in a month. And just everyone just suddenly remember that Usher is great and that we all love him. I hate to be to make it to forever. This is maybe not yet a full-blown comeback, but he has had one song lingering on the charts all year, and I think it's real good. Good, good, even. Are we good? Are we good, good on? Well, I sure am, Usher. Who knew it'd be like this? Having a hit at all is amazing for a guy who's been years old and has been making hits since the 90s. He's actually younger than I thought he was, but he's certainly much older than most people on the charts. Then again, R&B has always been a little kinder than other genres to its veterans. For good chunks of its history, especially its best years, this was music for adults, so it's fitting that Usher has the most grown-up song on the chart. But that don't mean that I can't wish you better. We ain't good, good, but we still good. A song about wishing the person who broke your heart good luck and a good life, it warms my heart. Like, I don't even care that Summer Walker, playing his ex, was literally not born yet when he made his first album. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about age gap stuff. You can go elsewhere for that. I wish you peace, I wish you good sex and good sleep. But you know, let's hear it for songs about being a fucking grown up, letting shit go and moving on even if it still hurts. My one caveat is it's a little too nice. Like they're being unrealistically cool about it. Cause we didn't get closer now that you ain't with me. You know, let's be honest about this. They're gonna try and stay friends and then fight's gonna break out and they're just gonna stop talking for a while. But you know, I like a little unrealism, right? No matter who you with, I wanna see you happy. Also, can we give it up for 21 Savage? Somehow between this and creeping, I got a girl, but I still feel alone. 21 Savage became our go-to rapper for navigating complicated emotions. Don't know how that happened. If you wanna open up a new salon, I still help pay for the wig. See, this is what I mean about it being unrealistic. Uh, like we're cool, but no, I'm not gonna be an angel investor for you. I come through from time to time and had you grabbing them sheets. That's if you want to. I'm just playing, girl. Stop smacking your teeth. Ah, uh, you're such a shit, Savage. Anyway, I think a full-blown Usher comeback is gonna happen. Happen. It will. It's gonna happen. Watch this. I'll be happy for you when you find another. We ain't good, but we still good. Number eight. So there was this thing over the last year or two where a whole bunch of very slow, unpoppy songs kept getting big and charting high, and I'm like, how is that happening? And the answer is, of course, TikTok. Of course. Slow songs sound better with those sped up remixes that the app likes. So for all I complain about it, TikTok is adding depth to popular music. the grave misfortune of trying to review pop music while being a straight cis man. If I have terrible taste, that's why. Because of that, I do feel a little on the outside of the whole Lana, Phoebe, Mitski, sad girl scene that's been blowing up lately. Lizzie McAlpine is a new singer and she's definitely part of that scene. She practically sounds like she's auditioning for the boy genius JV squad. So I don't know why this is the one that got to me, but it really did. Just heartbreaking every single time I heard it. You're kinda cute, but it... I am an extremely shallow person, so I feel not equipped to explain why I connected to it or what this song even means. But it's so short. My interpretation is it's about how you have a connection with someone for a second or like a one night stand or a brief relationship and it's just over really quickly. And it's kind of fitting that this song about fleeting relationships blew up on TikTok, the most fleeting of platforms. Just here with you. I feel it even though I don't necessarily know how to interpret poetry like this. I don't know why she's singing about ceiling exactly. And it feels like the start of a movie I've seen before. Uh, maybe it's like just about staring at the ceiling after the magic is over. Or, you know, something metaphorical like when you hit the ceiling in a relationship and there's just nowhere to go but down. The two opening words, Dealings and Plaster, I was kind of just picking words that sounded cool. I wasn't really thinking about the meaning. <laughs> See, that makes me feel a little better about not knowing what that meant. In any case, I will give this one to TikTok. I think they got this one right. 
I checked out whatever meme it's used for. I expect it to be like stupid and random, like a soundtrack to eating Tide Pods or something, but it just seems to be a bunch of pretty women spinning around in flowing dresses or running against scenic backdrops and uh, yeah, that is absolutely the vibe. Nailed it. Of course, they used the sped up chipmunk version, so they ruined it, but uh, you know, for TikTok, that's as close as you're gonna get. We'll give that one to them. Good job, TikTok. Before. Number seven. Oh, geez, K pop. <sighs> okay. Uh, I really should not be talking about this at all because y'all still scare me a lot. And, um, I mean, that's the thing, right? K-pop stands, especially for the acts that cross over here, are extremely loyal. And the reason for that is partially because these acts frame themselves as the underdogs. You know, they need your help. They need you to fight for them so that they can break the resistance of the xenophobic Western music industry. And that's true. That's, you know, that's basically all true. It's not a lie. At the same time, though, these underdogs are some of the biggest brands on the globe. McDonald's has had trouble breaking into foreign markets, too. They're still McDonald's. So it's almost refreshing that the biggest K-pop hit of the year didn't have a stan army forcing it to the top of the Hot 100. It was just really good. I gave a second chance to kill Fifty Fifty were rookies, just absolute nobodies in the K-pop scene, not only in this country, but their own. And it's hard to break into that scene, but their producers had an innovative strategy to make them stand out. What if we tried making good music? That's literally what he said. I guess he's saying you get graded on more than just the music in K-pop, so it makes sense. Uh, as someone who does not particularly care how cool their outfits are or how well they dance, I appreciate this music-first approach. K-pop often seems like it's trying to be state-of-the-art. This is pretty old school. Just your classic happy heartbreak song about romance being a waste of time. Hey, speaking of feeling stupid, uh, something I've had to come to terms with is that a lot of the songs I really like and put on my best list don't really stand the test of time. If I had to guess which song on this list is gonna be completely forgotten, it'll be this one. Like, it's pure cotton candy. It's feather light, and the band is cratering. Like, they barely had a chance to enjoy their success before they sued their label to get out of their own presumably awful K-pop contract, and they lost, and now most of them have been replaced. They're probably not going to be headlining Coachella anytime soon. But if this song does go away forever, I'm fine with that. Like, who said good music had to be remembered forever? This is a song about being a luckless loser. And if part of the reason I like the song so much is that it's an underdog story, I guess the band's sudden collapse only makes it that much more sympathetic. At the tail end of 2023, I like this song more than I like most others. And if it gets forgotten, I'll be left here feeling stupid, but who cares? Number six. Okay, I have a, like a running joke about all the bad predictions I made, but I've actually made plenty of good ones. All right, I said Teenage Dream was gonna hold up over time, check. I said Dua Lipa was gonna blow up, check again. So I'm gonna risk my luck and make another prediction who's on the up. Uh, you wanna know which pop star wannabe I think is gonna hit the A-list? Uh, here's my pick, Sabrina Carpenter. Mm -hmm. I think I only Sabrina Carpenter is yet another Disney Channel girl. Uh, I don't watch that stuff, so I don't know which one she was. I, I think she was Liv or, or Maddie. Liv and Maddie or Jesse, Lab Rats, I don't know. I only knew her as the bad guy in a YA movie I saw once and then the bad guy in a bigger pop singer's love triangle, which she responded to with one of the worst songs of that year. So I wasn't expecting much from her. But I've been trying to see more shows, so I wound up at one of her concerts. One of many concerts I was at last year where I was the only straight guy there who wasn't chaperoning his daughter. Surprised I didn't get arrested. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think she's got it. By contrast, I saw Ava Max and she does not got it. I'll be honest, looking at you got me thinking nonsense. Anyway, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of ex-Disney Channel girls out there trying to become pop stars, and Sabrina had had little luck breaking in, but 
She eventually found her entry point. So many of these wannabe pop stars, including Sabrina, had written about their angst and their inner worlds, and instead of doing that, what if she just wrote the dumbest song imaginable? But I can't help myself when you get close to me. Baby, my tongue goes numb. Sounds like bleh, bleh, bleh. This is obviously a big Ariana Grande homage slash ripoff, but I actually don't think Ariana's ever been this genuinely loose or funny. Sabrina has somehow managed to not outright say that she was really high when she wrote this, but I, I feel pretty safe in assuming. Caught was in my stomach when you walk in. When you got your arms around me, oh, it feels so good. I had to jump the octave. Had to jump the octave. I love this stupid fucking song so fucking much. But of course, nonsense really proved the reason for its existence with its instantly iconic outro. This song catchier than chicken pox is. I bet your house is where my other sock is. Woke up this morning, thought I'd write a pop hit. <laughs> How quickly can you take your clothes off pop quiz? <laughs> <laughs> that one's not gonna make it. <laughs> Most of these aren't gonna make it. And then we all had to like look at each other multiple times throughout, is that the stupidest thing or is it genius? It's genius and don't ever doubt yourself. The great poets of Persia and ancient Greece would weep. The house is where my other sock is. Woke up this morning, thought I'd write a pop hit. <laughs> How do you leave only one sock behind? Number five. Let's hear it for Morgan and Eric. Sat down on a bar stool like a darn fool. It's a story old as time. God made the world in seven short days. He said it was good. I bet it was great. No comment. All right. Yes, the N word guy. All right. He's one of the most popular artists alive, and several black artists have given him the okay, including the biggest one alive, all right? So shut up, disembodied voice of social media that haunts my psyche. Cancel! Anyway, I was conflicted about this, not just because of the controversy, but also just for reasons of quality. I had been a big fan of Morgan Wallen following his breakthrough, but... Uh, he followed that up with your typical post-blockbuster album. Do the same thing, but bigger, louder, and dumber. So we got a record full of trap beats, hip-hop interpolations, a bunch of semi-apologies for the N-word thing that would maybe be best not addressed at all, and about 40 repetitive songs about drinking whiskey. Whiskey, 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 whiskey. And after having to sit through that stream-trolling gargantuan album, I was pretty sick of him. And yet, at the end of the year, uh, here we are. I'm surprised as you are. I guess a guy puts out 80 songs in a year, at least one of them's gonna be good. So God made a girl his best work of art. Oh, but he didn't make no place to go and she breaks your heart. So man made a ball. Look, I'm just trying to be honest with myself. I still am who I am. If you're gonna keep watching my stuff, you're gonna have to put up with some more songs about being sad in the bar, all right? Because you know, that situation's not getting any better. Uh, it helps a lot that Wallen gets a big assist from Eric Church. Some say it's a cover band, that's a cover man. I know why they're here. Uh, Church has always been one of the country guys it's okay to like. In fact, he's like the last guy in country with consistent good taste. It used to be him and Chris Stapleton, and then Chris Stapleton did that Monday Night Football thing. Us versus them. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just like this song a lot. Get out of the world. Seven short days. It's one of those corny country songs where they take something classy like the Bible and put drinking in it. But he didn't make no place to go when she breaks your heart. I do find something comforting in the idea that my own personal miseries are on a biblical scale and that the bar is a direct response to God's failures to humanity. Look, we all got our things to be sad to. You got your Phoebe Bridgers, I have this, right? Morgan, if you fucking embarrass me again, I swear to God.
Number four. Ryan. Wow. It's good to see you, buddy. It's been a while. Do you know? Is there an actor more popular right now than Ryan Gosling? With like both men and women? Like he's pretty, but also he can be the stoic badass. He certainly has range, but there's one role he excels at in particular. A simulation of a human being who's crying on the inside and struggling to fit in amongst real people. He plays it over and over, and he played it so well in the biggest movie of the year that he's a leading candidate for an Oscar win this year, but he has already achieved a rare feat for an actor. In a soundtrack filled with actual pop stars like Dua Lipa, Billie Eilish, and Lizzo, he had an actual charting hit with the most talked about song in the movie of the year. I'm just kidding, anywhere else I'd be tame. Is it yeah, that was a good bit. Anyway, here's a Billy Eilish one. I used to float, now I just fall down. I used to know. This was actually going to be a little higher, but by the end of the year, I'm actually a little tired of seeing it at the top of every critics list and award ceremony. Odds makers are saying this is probably going to get Billy her second Oscar in a row. I have no idea if Billy saw this coming. Who knew that a two hour toy commercial would inspire some of her best work? Turns out I'm not real, just something you paid for. What happened was apparently she was having an existential crisis. In fact, as far as I can tell, she's been having one ever since she got famous. And apparently she related to Barbie finding out that she's just a product to be bought and paid for, as all celebrities are also. What was I made for? Like, of course Billy would feel it more than anyone. She actually is a doll. Look at this. Got this out of Amazon. Comes with like a bunch of Grammys, garbage can to put them in. Uh, I don't have all her fashion accessories out with me right now, but uh, you should see her in a crown. Anyway, it's been fascinating to watch this really get to people and go from the third most popular song on the Barbie soundtrack to one of the most acclaimed songs of the year. I mean, I gotta admit, I felt it too. I also don't have a clue what I was made for. Not to review music, I'll tell you that. In fact, this song made me feel for Ken even more than I'm Just Ken did. I'm sad again. Don't tell my boyfriend. It's not what he's made for. I saw a lot of people single out that line. There's something just really heartbreaking about having someone who loves you but can't help you or or being the guy who can't help i mean yeah i'm just like ken i'm just a pretty face also <sighs> man more sad songs on this list than usual how'd that happen i don't think i was any sadder than usual granted my usual is really really sad actually hey wait a minute when did it end all the enjoyment There's a cursed mashup someone should make. What was a bar made for? Please don't make that. Something I made for. Number three. As long as I'm doing my Jim Cramer routine on here, picking winners, I also think Victoria Monet is a stock you can ride to the moon. Buy it now. We're all gonna make it. When they say she get it from her mama, I'm gonna say you fuck her right, body boot is unpolite. At the very least, I'll be very disappointed Victoria Monet does not take a big jump. In case you don't know here, Victoria Monet has been Ariana Grande's secret weapon for a long time, co wrote some of her big hits. Allegedly, she has two of the rings from Seven Rings. I'm matching diamonds for six of my bitches. And I, I assume that means she killed one of the other ring bearers. If I were the rest of Ariana's friends, I'd be worried. And she is now at last getting due for her own music. Put that on my mama, on my hood. I look fly, I look good. Like a lot of great confident songs about being slash looking awesome, On My Mama was written to cheer herself up after being depressed. On My Mama just was a concept that came and was something that I needed to hear and be able to use affirmations to, to say good things about myself. And See, I love stories like that because I would not have guessed in a billion kajillion years. I guess that's when you have to work the hardest to sound confident, but boy, she nailed it. Oh, 
That's funny, I thought the whole on my mama thing was just a tossed off line, but apparently motherhood kind of mattered at her. She had just had her own kid. For that record to be about moms and celebrating my mom, and then hopefully one day my daughter will sing it about me. Boy, that's a lot of pressure to be putting on your kid. But I, I know you think I'm fine, I, I, might be too fine to hit it from behind. I, I. See, that's a great line. Uh, I wouldn't want to hear my kid singing that. Your opinion is irrelevant, but I. Oh, okay. So deep in my bag, like a grandma with a peppermint. Do I really have to say anything? For those who ask why the best and worst list takes so long for me to make, uh, there's a difference between having strong feelings and having strong thoughts about a song. I don't know what to say, it just fucking cooks. Check out that bass line. Listen to that, you got like 70s wiki wiki funk guitar, an honest to god horn section. Whatever R&B era you like, this should do it for you. I hope she wins all the Grammys. I hope she has a good year. Let's make this the year of the Jaguar. Number two. You know, thinking about my work in general, I've noticed that I will dunk on male artists, especially for being douchebags. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's fair. The douchebag is an important figure in music. They make some of our best songs. Let's have a toast for the douchebags. Like many of the best songwriters in the world hit their hardest by capturing themselves at their worst. And uh, we just had a new classic drop this year. This is Style Drunk. I uh, hope you guys sing a little bit of it with me at least. I'm proud of all the punches that I've thrown In the name of someone I no longer know Noah Kahn seems like he should wear a hat, right? I guess he doesn't want to cover up that beautiful hair, but uh, he makes hat music. Stomp, clap, hat, I call it. I'll work on it. Anyway, here's a prediction that I missed. Someone told me that Noah Kahn was going to be big, but uh, I didn't bother to go check him out because hat music is not really my thing. By the time I did, he was already blowing up. But it turns out he's the real deal. Like, at last, someone to fill the void left by Mumford and Sons, who, I mean, let's be real, they only ever really had the one song. Noah Kahn, meanwhile, already has two big hits, and I like them both, but uh, this is the one I really, really like. Dial Drunk is gonna stick around. Like, you're gonna hear this song a lot. This is gonna be a dorm room classic. I love this song. And ladies, if a guy tells you he loves this song, you have every right to take that as a red flag. Dial Drunk is about being a drunken fuck up, and a drunk dial is cringe in the best of circumstances, but this is a drunk dial from the drunk tank. I don't like the way they do me in the car. I gave your names my emergency phone call. He obviously did something stupid to get in there, and he's stupider still when he tries to call a girl who apparently hates him to come bail him out. Come on, man, you gotta have a buddy you can call. Leave her alone. Ring and ring, even the cops thought you were off for hanging up. Oh, well, you know, if the cops sympathize with you, you must be the good guy. What a bitch, right? But like I said, sometimes a writer can depict themselves at their absolute worst and just wallow in how pitiful they are, and it hits. Like, I'm gonna judge. I dial drunk, I'll die a drunk, I'll die here. I dial drunk, I'll die a drunk. I mean, that's just beautiful. How has that not already been a lyric? This song already sounds like it's always existed. It's my faith, I'll praise the flag. Wait, I swear she'll call me back. Son, are you a danger to yourself? Now, he is a noob to pop stardom. He needed an assist from Post Malone to get on the radio. But even that kind of works. It's shockingly not terrible. That's how good the song is. This is the best stomp, clap, banjo song I've heard in forever. Get a hat though. I mean, it, it just doesn't look right. Woo, yay! All right, before we move on, some honorable mentions. And I feel like I'm at such a disadvantage only speaking one language. Like, you don't have to know Spanish to like the song, but it's Shakira's diss track against her ex-husband, Gerard Piquet. And having seen the translation, believe me that she fucking cooks this guy. She cooks him harder than Aryan Robin did at the 2014 World Cup. I'm different. 
talking about you. Love it when he hit and it smacked you. Baby, let me lick on your tattoos. That's Man, I'm gonna get over whatever my problem is with Doja Cat just in time for everyone to turn on her. Yeah, I finally got a handle. Finally got a handle on you. One of the best produced songs of this year. I'm being serious. I love it. Much closer to making this list than you'd probably expect. Super shy, super shy, but... Like this is the one K-pop band I'm really into. I am very excited to hear more from them, unless something horrible comes out about all the people behind them, which I am told is very possible. Very hard cut here. This is another one I think people are going to still love in 20 years. If I cared more about what I thought would age well, I would have bumped this one way up. Ah, <sighs> Scoreface. In a drop tie ride with you, I feel like Scoreface. I'm sorry that you're jaded. Oh, another hard cut. I like this way more than Flowers. I don't get why this wasn't the hit. You can, you can catch me now. In much the same way that a fucking song from Barbie might go down as one of Billy's most beloved songs, uh, I really do think that this is one of Olivia's best. Yes, the Hunger Games song. I'm gonna make a whole bunch of Hunger Games fan bits of this song once I'm done making this video. Yeah, you thought that this was the end. And now, with no further ado. Number one. How do I put this? You know in uh, Weedus' Teenage Dirtbag, where the loser finally talks to this super awesome dream girl, and it turns out she likes all the same things he does. I've got two tickets to all your rain and rain. That's kind of how I feel listening to Olivia Rodrigo. I haven't heard from you in a couple of months, but I'm out right now and I'm all fucked up. And like, if I had to name what is Olivia Rodrigo's biggest asset, the thing that made her the biggest new pop star of the 2020s, it's that she likes all the music that I, Todd in the Shadows, also like. This is a surefire path to stardom, remember this. Like, it's not just that she has good taste, she has interesting taste. She just likes and emulates different music than the rest of her peers. She likes all the cool chicks of the alt rock from the 2000s and the 90s and maybe the 80s. Fuck it, it's fine. Yes, I know that he's the thing is that a lot of the time I find those cooler than cool alt bands too cool, just off-puttingly inaccessible, but Olivia is not that at all. She is not a hipster alt chick, she's a theater kid first and foremost, just completely hard on her sleeve the entire time. And that means she can make these kick-ass rock and roll songs while still staying completely relatable. Even here for her only song that does not seem to be a look at her or her emotions or her angst or her inner world. Instead, she just lets it fucking rip. Bad Idea Right is basically Olivia's nonsense. It's, it's about making bad, horny decisions. I think it is pure fiction. At least I hope it is. I hope this isn't about the same guy Vampire is about, but I, I don't think it is. It's so silly. This is her taking the same approach as like Bruno Mars, but instead of for 80s R&B, it's for teen movie soundtrack pop punk. Just taking all the music she likes that hasn't been made in a while and reminding everyone how good it is and just cramming the thing with hooks. And of course, it has the single best two seconds of the year. Beautiful. Not only is this the best song of the year, it is number one on my list of best stops on the word stop of the year. And here's some honorable mentions. I wasn't entirely convinced by her first album, and I feel bad that the biggest hit from the second album I did not like at all, but this song I think made me a fan for life. And for all the stands that got mad at me for her being on the worst list, you know what? Fine. Okay. I take it back. Olivia can curse. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Fuck it, it's fine. And one last thing. That was all good music. And you know who else made some good music that I've been meaning to check out myself? The Beatles. And Lindsay Ellis is back, and she's made a great video about the Beatles, and why Yoko didn't break them up, and why everyone hates Yoko anyway. I'm actually in that one. I voice Mark David Chapman. 
I gained 67 pounds for the role just like Jared Leto did. It's a really fascinating video where every single person who broke up the Beatles will be named and shamed. And if you want to know why Yoko is innocent, you can watch the first 10 minutes on YouTube and then you can see the full complete version on Nebula, a creator-specific platform where you can watch other great videos from creators such as H Bomber Guy, Adam Neely, Big Joel, FD Signifier, Be Kind Rewind, and myself. It is the most exciting independent streaming platform around right now. It has tons of original content that you cannot find anywhere else. In fact, Nebula has been a godsend for so many people I know trying to make it in this cutthroat world of online video. Nebula allows us to make the kind of stuff we want to make, instead of YouTube where the algorithm will wreck and demonetize tons of videos, including probably this one you're watching right now. And if you sign up with my link, not only will you get access to the entire Nebula library, but you will get it for a little over $2.50 a month. And you'd also be directly supporting me, which, you know, I'd appreciate it. So click the link in the description and check it out below. Thank you for listening, and good night. Put, 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 put,